Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone to our service this morning. First song will be number 730. Number 730. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus in the morning, Jesus at the noon time. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus when the sun goes down. Love him, I'm gonna love him, love him in the morning. Love him at the noon time. Love him, I'm gonna love him. Love him when the sun goes down. Serve him, I'm gonna serve him. Serve him in the morning. Serve him at the noon time. Serve him, I'm gonna serve him. Serve him when the sun goes down. Thank him, I'm gonna thank him. Thank him in the morning. Thank him at the noon time. Thank him, I'm gonna thank him. Thank him when the sun goes down. Praise him, I'm gonna praise him. Praise him in the morning, praise him at the noon time. Praise him, I'm gonna praise him. Praise him when the sun goes down. Welcome everybody to our worship service this morning. Uh, those of you who are our guests, uh, we invite you to fill out a attendance card in the pew in front of you and put that in the collection plate. Uh, it is an honor to have you here and visiting with us. It's great to have everybody here this morning. Our times of service, uh, we just had our Bible study which starts at 9.30. Of course our morning worship at uh, 10.30. Tonight we'll have worship at 6 o'clock and Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock. Our sympathy is extended to uh, Reese Christensen and the passing of his grandmother last week. Uh, please keep this family in your prayers. And I have a thank you note. Uh, dear Stroudsville, thank you so much for the beautiful plant and prayers given to us during this difficult time. We are thankful for such a caring church family. Love Reese and Mary Grace Christensen. So let's keep them in our prayers. Let's remember those on our prayer list uh, in the bulletin. And also there's a prayer list posted on the board in the foyer as well. Our perfect attendance for July Sunday School, our preschool, uh, Lily Parrish, fourth and fifth grade, Nathan Farrell, Chloe Blunt, Knox Blunt, and Bryson Albright, uh, middle school, Gage Shipman, and high school, Gabby Shipman. Bible Bowl practice today is at 4.30. Our men's business meeting is today at 5 p.m. Uh, all men in the congregation are encouraged to attend. Ashland City Church of Christ is having their Vacation Bible School on August 2nd through the 4th from 6 to 7.15. It's for age 3 through the 6th grade. And there is a flyer on the Youth Bulletin Board in the foyer. Ladies Sewing Group will meet Thursday at 12.30 in the Fellowship Hall. There will be a back-to-school event for grades 6 through 12 at the home of Reese and Mary Grace Christensen on Saturday, August 7th. This event is for students only, parents. Parents are the problem, apparently. Parents can drop off at their home at 5.30 and pick up at 8.30. Uh, boys bring chips. Girls bring desserts. Uh, there is a sign-up on the youth bulletin board in the foyer, so please sign up if you're able to attend. Kids only. Our Meals on Wheels ministry will be next Sunday. Uh, we'll be preparing uh, meals for 10 people, so if you have any questions, please see Christy Albright. The next singing at Dogwood Bend Assisted Living will be August 14th. Uh, please plan to meet at the church at 2 p.m. to ride together to the facility. Uh, please bring your mask and let's brighten the residence day by lifting our voices in song. Our Friends and Family Day uh, will be starting Sunday, August the 15th, and that will also be the kickoff for the gospel meeting with Brother Walt Lever. Uh, please start inviting your friends. There are flyers located uh, on the podium out in the foyer. 
Hillcrest Church of Christ is hope, hosting a youth rally on Saturday, August 14th. Uh, the flyer is on the youth bulletin board in the foyer as well. Main Street Church of Christ is hosting a Brotherhood Golf Scramble on August the 27th. That information is posted as well. And then save the date, Hildell Church of Christ is hosting a Ladies' Day. So ladies, save the date. On Saturday, August 28th, a flyer is posted on the board in the foyer as well. There are also some dishes on the counter in the kitchen for the ladies to pick up. Uh, if you would do that, please. And I have one more thank you note. It says, thank you, thank you, thank you. We are so thankful for the help you provided in the kitchen at camp. The fish was amazing. We could not have been successful this year without all the Stroudsville workers, Tim, Becca, and Grayson Overstreet. That's all the announcements I have. We'll have a reading at this time. morning. A reading this morning comes from Luke chapter 11 verses 5 through 13. Luke chapter 11 5 through 13 and I'll be reading from the New American Standard. And he said to them, suppose one of you shall have a friend and shall go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves for a friend of mine has come to me from a journey and have nothing to set before him. And from inside he shall answer and say, do not bother me. The door has already been shut, and my children and I are in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. And I say to you, ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it shall be opened. Now suppose one of you fathers is asked by his son for a fish. He will not give him a snake instead of a fish, will he? Or if he is asked for an egg, he will not give him a scorpion, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? song before opening and prayer be number 223 223 swiftly we're turning life's daily pages swiftly the hours are changing to years how are we using God's golden moments Shall we reap glory? Shall we reap tears? Into our hands the gospel is given. Into our hands is given the light. Haste, let us carry God's precious message. Guiding the airing back to the right. Millions are groping without the gospel. Quickly they'll reach eternity's night. Shall we sit idly as they rush onward? Haste, let us hold up Christ a true light. Into our hands the gospel is given. Into our hands is given the light. Haste, let us carry God's precious message guiding the airing back to the right. Souls that are precious, souls that are dying, while we rejoice, our sins are forgiven. 
Did he not also die for these lost ones? Then let us point the way unto him. Into our hands the gospel is given. Into our hands is given the light. Haste, let us carry God's precious message, guiding the erring back to the right. Would you pray to me, please? Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this day and thankful for the opportunity we have to come and and to worship you, Lord, just ask you to be with us during our worship service and help us to focus our attention on you and give you the praise and glory, honor that you deserve. Lord, we're so thankful for our congregation, each and every member. Lord, thankful for our elders and ask for your blessings on them and our deacons and the many ministries that they support and ask that you please be with them. Lord, we're thankful for Brother Tom and the message that he brings us. Every week, just ask that you uh, be with him this morning as he brings us another lesson from your word. Lord, I know there are members who are not able to be here this morning. Some are sick, not feeling well. Um, some are joining us by live stream. Lord, I just ask that you please uh, be with them. And uh, for whatever reason, they may not be able to be with us. For those who are sick, we ask that you please put your healing hand on them. Lord, we also ask that you be with those who are uh, carrying heavy burdens at this time. Lord, help us as Christians to reach out to them. Lord, we want to remember those who are grieving the loss of loved ones. And, Lord, we want to remember specifically at this time the Christian Christian family and passing the unexpected passing of Reese's grandmother. Lord, I just ask that you please uh, comfort them as only you can. Lord, we're so thankful for our successful Vacation Bible School and uh, such a joy to see the children delight and learning uh, about your word and story of Joseph, Lord, so thankful for all the many different members who came together and, and helped, helped put Vacation Bible School on. Lord, just so thankful for this congregation and the way that we uh, love one another and work together and, and pull off an event like that. Lord, uh, as uh, summer's closing down and coming to an end, Lord, I just want to pray a special prayer now for our uh, teachers and administrators of this congregation who will be going back to school. Lord, we pray that they have a, a, a good year. They ask that you please uh, bless them, protect them, help them to be uh, a shining light in their, their workplace and the influence that they have on, on their, both their peers and, and their students. Lord, I also want to pray for uh, students of this congregation. know that they'll be going back to school and meeting up with friends and interacting with friends that they hadn't seen all summer, just to ask that you please uh, help them to be a, a, a good influence on those who they come in contact with. Lord, I ask that you please uh, protect them and, and guard and direct them. Lord, we know that there's many temptations that are coming their way in and, and so many different uh, ways, and pray that they're able to focus uh, on you and, and their relationship with you and, and do what's right, especially when it's uh, not the popular thing to do, Lord. Lord, we're just so thankful for Jesus, thankful that uh, he came to this earth to, to live as a man and, and to give himself up on a cross as we're about to uh, turn, turn our hearts and minds in our worship to, to communion with one another, help us to be mindful of that sacrifice, and it's that sacrifice that gives us a hope of being in heaven with you someday. It's through Jesus Christ's name that we pray. Amen. To prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper, we'll sing number 160. 160, we'll sing the first and last verses. I love the Lord, for he died my soul to save. On Calvary, his dear life he freely gave from rims of 
Jesus freely came to die, that I might live someday with him on high. I love the Lord, he has been so good to to set me free. No greater love than is could ever be. I love the Lord because He first loved me. love so full and free. He taught us why that our love like his should be. To be like him and compassion freely give. His name within with him could live. I love the Lord, He has been so good to me. He gave His life from sin to set me free. No greater love than is could ever be. I love the Lord because he first loved me. If serving, you is, is, if serving is below you, leadership is beyond you. This is an anonymous quote that I saw that made me think of the different types of servants. In the world, we usually think of servants as somebody that's beneath us, that we put them at a lower standard than we sometimes put ourselves. As Christians, we think of servants as a good thing, as Jesus was a servant, and he taught us that serving will make you one of the greatest. Jesus gave many examples of serving to, of others that would consider him the most important leader that we should follow. In Mark 10, 45, it says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. In John 13, the story of Jesus washing the disciples' feet is told, Jesus humbled himself and washed their feet, and in verse 14 says, If I then, the Lord and teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Matthew 23, 10 through 11 says, Do not <clears throat> be called leaders, for one is your leader, that is Christ, but the greatest among you shall be your servant. Jesus became the ultimate servant by going to the cross on our behalf. Even though he was the great leader, he lowered himself to serve all of mankind. We should also strive to be this servant to all those around us. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all that you do for us. We especially thank you for Jesus and the sacrifice that he made on our behalf. We thank you for this bread that represents his body that hung on the cross. 
We pray that we would remember the suffering and sacrifice that he did on our behalf, that we would never take that for granted, that we would go out and share Jesus' story to others before it's everlastingly too late. We thank you for for him and, and his sacrifice, and in Christ's name we pray, amen. Let's continue to give thanks. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this cup that represents Christ's blood that was shed on the cross. And we pray that we would always remember that, that that blood continually cleanses us and that we thank you for that sacrifice he made for us and that blood that was shed. We thank you for the example that Christ set for us also and that we should strive to live by that example to serve others and to love everyone we just thank you for everything that you do in christ's name we pray amen This concludes the Lord's Supper. At this time, we've set aside that we might remember the offering this morning. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you for all the physical blessings that you give us, our jobs and our health and our ability to earn money for our families. And at this time, we want to give back a portion of that to you. And we just pray that these funds will be used in a manner to further your word and and works in this community and throughout the world. Father, we just ask you to just continue to bless us here at Stroudsville and the things that we do in your name. Just continue to watch over and bless us all. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. like to mark your song books or song invitation after the lesson be number 559 559 for the lesson stand and sing number 646 646 when peace like a red Attendeth my way when sorrows like sea billows roll. Whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say. Yeah. 
my soul. It is well. It is well with my soul. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious song. My sin, not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul, it is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. And Lord, haste the day when the face shall be sigh. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll, the trump shall resound, and the Lord shall descend, even so in his will with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. Be seated, please. Good morning. Appreciate all of you being here today. And we're going to round out our Are You a Good Neighbor lesson series with lesson three. And I just wanted to say before we get into the lesson how much I appreciate all of the Vacation Bible School volunteers, teachers, whatever you did. We had a, a great VBS. It was, it was fun to watch the children being so engaged with the stories of Joseph night after night. Uh, I heard more than one say they had to come back to find out what happened to him. And so they came back and they learned. And I'm just so thankful to Shannon for her leadership and organizational skills, all the volunteers who did what they needed to do to make VBS not only fun, but the kids learned a lot. And it's just, I think it's a kind of a star for us to, to have a good VBS, to have a good name in the community. And little children will come back year after year and have great memories as adults of learning about Jesus. So thank you. If you were involved, I've heard there's a, a video floating out. Samuel Farrell did it for us. I'm not sure how to get it. You can ask uh, some of our members how to, how to view that, maybe online, but it's a great little video that's it's a summary of some of the pictures of Vacation Bible School. So thank you to Samuel for producing that video for us for VBS. And Shannon, we're looking forward to next year. Let us rest first, and then, yeah, and then we'll, we'll plan again. It was fun. Are You a Good Neighbor? Um, house to House, Heart to Heart is a publication that we're involved in, and we're trying to reach out in the community. We're trying to change the culture of Stroudsville to think more about sharing the gospel. How do we teach lost people that are good people, but maybe they don't have Jesus in their life? How do we reach people through our own relationships, our own friendships, our own neighbors? And the answer is that you begin by being aware you begin by watching the, the model 
that Jesus showed us, and that is by loving people, by ministering, by being there. And so you have to reach people by letting them know you love them and care for them. The next slide is basically true. People don't really want to know if you have a doctorate degree or a master's. They don't care if you're, you know, super smart. They just want to know that you care about them. But more importantly, and I've learned this in my own life personally, when you have a need and somebody is there for you to help you in that time of need or crisis, just physically being there says so much about that person. I care for you. Um, I care about your needs. I want to help you in your time of need. Just to be there for somebody uh, goes a long way. You know, it's so easy for us to get caught up in this, well, I'll be thinking about you or I'll pray for you. And we say those words, they, they come out pretty easily, but does it really translate into our action, into our being there for somebody? So I, I, if nothing else today, I want you to realize, don't just say to somebody, I'll be thinking about you or I'll be praying for you. Go that extra step and be there and show them how much you care. Do something. Do some small, tangible act of service and kindness to let people know that you sincerely care about them. And I think at that point, you've earned an opportunity to tell them about Jesus. In our last two lessons, we looked at the Good Samaritan in Luke 10. This is a, a graphic that I showed because it's a, it's a pretty good representation of probably what men found when they were walking along and a deserted a, a road out in the desert, a wilderness road. They come across a man, for all they know, he's dead. And, and so in Luke 10, we see this, this masterful tale of the Good Samaritan where Jesus shows three people involved who come across this uh, man that had been beaten by robbers. Now, the, the first two men, we're told, they, they were religious men. One, as a matter of fact, was a priest and... This man, laying on the ground, face down, could have been dead for all we know. Had the priest touched him, he would have been instantly, ceremoniously unclean for seven whole days. He wouldn't have been able to perform his duties. So I sort of understand why the priest, the holy man, may have been hesitant to touch this man and get involved. The second individual was a person in charge of caring for the temple area, for helping the priest, offering animal sacrifices. He too, like any Jew, would have been ceremoniously unclean had he touched a dead body. But it's kind of sad that neither one of them got involved. Getting involved in people's lives, especially if they have problems, if they've messed up, um, it's inconvenient. It's not always easy helping other people. Rarely is it help, easy to help other people, but that's how you show you love people. That's how you show you care as you get involved. The first men did not. They passed by. As a matter of fact, Jesus says in his story, they went by, kind of made a wide path around him on the other side of the road. Now, Jesus introduces a third character, and he tells us about a Samaritan, and this Samaritan who, coincidentally, the Jews hated Samaritans. It's like, oh, we hate Samaritans. Very strong dislike. Jesus made this person the hero because he made a difference. He got involved. And so, church, if you want to be a good neighbor, you got to be there for people. You have to get involved. You have to reach out. You have to be inconvenienced. You have to give your time. You have to build relationships with people. But they first have to see that you care. The Bible tells us in the parable of the Good Samaritan, when he, the Samaritan, saw him, he had compassion. Now, it's one thing to say, oh, you poor soul, I know you're having a bad day, and I have compassion, I, I, I'm empathetic with you, I feel for you, and keep walking by. What have you really done? The answer is nothing. He got involved. He got very involved. As a matter of fact, we have a, a list of some things that he did. Jesus identifies these in his story of the Good Samaritan, and, and we're reviewing these past two lessons. The first thing he did is he stopped, all right? Don't know where he was going. Don't know if he was on a business trip. Don't know if he was going to see family, if he was on his way to the marketplace. Jesus doesn't say he stopped. He made the man laying on the road 
his first priority. He stopped. If you're going to help people, if you want to be a good neighbor, you've got to stop. Now, let me caution you. Be careful. Because there's some people out in our society that are a little twisted, maybe a little evil, and they want to pretend like they're having a problem. And when you stop to be a good Samaritan, they may hit you in the head and take your car or your money, right? So be careful. Just be wise. Be care- Especially, ladies, if you're single, if you're driving by yourself, be careful if you stop to help somebody on the side of the road. There's, there's ways to do this, but you have to stop. This man stopped and he gave immediate medical attention. He bandaged his wounds. He probably rubbed olive oil on them. He, had, he used whatever he had to give medical attention to this man. The other thing I find amazing is he got off his donkey, rendered medical attention, then put the injured man, the beaten man, on his own beast of burden, whether it was a horse or a donkey. Or, we just don't, we don't know, but he said he put him on his own, I'm assuming, donkey, He traveled with this man to the nearest inn, and he stayed with him, caring for him, rendering medical care, apparently through the night. If you read the story, it's implied that he stayed with him. The next morning, he tells the innkeeper, look, I don't know how long it's going to take this man to recover, but he needs medical care. Will you give it to him? I'm going to pay you some money ahead of time to care for him. He goes on his way. He says, when I come back, when I come back to check on him, I'll pay you whatever I owe you. And so you have to conclude when Jesus tells the story, this was a man who was willing to roll up his sleeves and get involved. He was a good neighbor. At the conclusion of this story, if we go back to the beginning, we see it was a lawyer who asked Jesus, trying to set Jesus up and ask him a trick question. He had asked, who is my neighbor? Jesus responds at the end of the story, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor the man who fell among the robbers. The lawyer, the attorney responded, verse 37, the one who showed him mercy. Now I want to stop and reflect on this story because like me, you may be curious, right? If I could go back in time and if I could, if I could sort of talk to this man or study the man who had recovered and gotten well, What do you think this man who had been beaten and robbed and received this kind of love and care, how do you think he felt about the one who cared for him? I think he'd been been very grateful. He might have even gone to the trouble of saying, remember remember the Samaritan who cared for me and, and, and helped me in so many ways back when I was near death? I want to find him again. I want to meet him and talk to him and thank him. Maybe even bring a big gift basket, you know, a fruit or wine or something just to say thank you. The gratitude that would have been poured out because of the love shown is clear. As a matter of fact, if I believe I had been able to go back in time and interview the man and just say, tell me about this individual who helped you. Could you walk me through the process of what he did to care for you, and how do you feel about that? Oh, you wouldn't believe what this individual did for me. Here I was near death, I've been told, and he he bandaged my wounds, he took me to the inn, he cared for me, he paid for my care, Um, he came back, he checked on me. What kind of love do you describe when love is shown to you that way? It's unconditional love. It's putting my needs ahead of his own needs. Wow, I wish there were more people like that in this world. Would you not agree that a lot of us in society today, it's sort of like, I matter. My time is important. Give me what I want. I deserve to be happy. Is that not what society is telling us today? It is, isn't it? Y'all can nod your head like this. It's a rhetorical question. The answer is yes, that is what we are told in society today. You matter, you're important, your needs should go ahead of anyone else. I'm number one, take care of my needs, meet my needs. As Jason pointed out in our communion meditation, 
That's not the kind of leader God wants, is it? The kind of leader God wants is a leader who serves, who gives of his time or her time to others. That's what makes a good neighbor. That's why the Samaritan in this story is the hero, because he showed compassion. And I suspect that the man who'd been injured and beaten nearly to death felt very indebted to the man who cared for him. You see, church, it's so simple if you think about it. If you want to earn the right to tell people about your Jesus, if you want to earn the right for them to listen to what you have to say, you have to show them you care. It's that simple. Show them you care. Get involved in their... But Brother Tom, what if it's a mess? What if their life is all messed up? And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. A soul is a soul is a soul. And Jesus cares for all souls equally. He wants all people to be saved. No matter where they live, no matter how they've messed up, no matter what they've done, they're a precious soul that Jesus loves. So Jesus ministered often, church, to those in his society that other people had nothing to do with. Think about it. The prostitutes. Those who lived in the outer fringes of society. The lepers. The ones who were forced to say unclean, unclean. Those who were disabled, maybe with physical problems. The cripples the deaf, the blind, poor beggars that smelled. They didn't have good hygiene. Jesus touched them. He loved them. He cared for them. He got involved. That's the role model Jesus wants us to follow. Not the easy fix, not the convenient fix, not the person that we can do something in five minutes, go on our way, oh, I feel good, I've done my good deed for today. No, you get involved in those complicated, difficult situations where people need help. There's just a few lessons today in our, in our lesson that I, I want to convey to you, things that are important that we all know, but we need to be reminded about. First of all, I want to look at the scripture to remind us about influencing others. It's in 1 Peter chapter 11. Probably not a, a scripture you, you connect with your power to influence others. 1 Peter chapter 11. Peter writes, likewise, actually I think I've misquoted that, but forgive me. 1 Peter uh, Peter says, Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. So here's the context. What Peter is saying, as he writes to the church, he says, Look, some of you ladies out there understand that you've become Christians. You're now members of the local congregation, but your husbands are not believers. They may be even antagonistic toward your faith in Jesus Christ. They may want nothing to do with this church group you attend. I, I remember reading the story of Lee Strobel. Maybe you read as well. Uh, Lee Strobel wrote The Case for Christ. Lee was an atheist. He didn't want anything to do with God. He, he was a writer for the Chicago News Tribune. And so he was trying to go out and basically show people this God people are getting sucked into. This story of a resurrected Christ, oh my goodness. It's a scam. His wife started attending this little um, group of Christians in a, in a movie theater. They would rent the movie theater, and she started going and giving money. He's like, oh, my own wife is getting sucked into this, the scandal. These people want your money. How can you be so naive? And so he went as far as going with her to expose the scam. 
I'll show you. I'm going to go with you to church and show you. So he goes back to the lobby. He sees his cassette tapes. A long time ago, that's what we used to do to record things. He picked up a cassette tape. How much do you want for this, he said, to the people working in the booth. Nothing. It's free. <laughs> We're going to give it to you if you need it. God bless you. And so he goes home and he goes, well, that was a pretty good message. But I still think they're trying to scam you out of your money. That's all they want. And so week after week, she showed him Jesus through her life. And he began to want to learn more about this Jesus. Why? Listen, church, it was because his sweet wife, who gave her life to Jesus, without a word, she showed him respect and love. And he noticed that she was changing in ways that he really couldn't describe. These Christians, there's something about them that's different. They really care. So she would consult privately with other Christian ladies and say, what, what are we going to do about my husband? He's a good man, but he's not a believer. You know, They said, don't, don't push. Don't push him. And so she, she would very subtly like leave books on the coffee table. Maybe he'll pick it up and read this. Maybe I'll put a bookmark in the page and highlight it or something. He'll get the idea. But over time, he grew more interested in learning. You see, it was her godly, quiet, peaceful influence, her respectful attitude, her conduct, the purity in her life, the goodness in her heart that drew him to Jesus. Why do I use the scripture in Peter? Because, church, you don't always have to hit people with Bibles over the head to get their attention. You don't have to win the debate, right? I'm going to win this debate. I can out-argue you. No, no. You love people, and even without a word, you convert them by your conduct, by your goodness, by the purity of your heart. They will see you and draw their own conclusions about your sincerity. If they know you care, what makes you so different? I want to know why you believe what you believe. How has your life gotten to this point that makes you the way you are? And so without a word, we realize that what we do carries so much more weight than what we say. And in this case, Peter says to these wives of non-believers, be godly, be submissive. Let them see Jesus in your life, and you can win them over for Christ without a word. And so with her godly influence, she can do just that. Turn to Matthew 5, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible, the Sermon in the Mount, a culmination of all of the teachings of Jesus in one sermon, the law of grace. I like the way Jesus starts out the Sermon in the Mount in Matthew 5. I like to hear those Bible pages turning. In Matthew 5, Jesus says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are the meek. He goes through all of the Beatitudes. And then in, in verse 11, he says, You're even blessed when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad. When you follow Jesus, when you serve other people, when you show kindness, the world is not always going to treat you in a nice way. Matter of fact, they may ridicule you. And they may hate you. But then Jesus says in verse 13, and I'd like for the next couple of minutes to focus on this. It's so important. He says in Matthew 5, Verse 13, you, he says to his disciples, those listening to this sermon, you are the salt of the earth. Now, I recently watched a, a TV series called The Chosen, maybe you're aware of it, where Matthew is listening to Jesus as Jesus prepares for the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is rehearsing and going through the construct 
of this lesson. He wants it to be just right because he knows the lesson will be impactful. And so here is Matthew. Matthew's a tax collector. He's used to writing things down and he's doing record keeping and helping, helping Jesus in this, this video construct the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus gets to the salt part. And Matthew literally, he like puts his pen down. He's like, huh? Salt? Jesus, why, would you, why in the world would you tell people they're salt? And so Jesus, in this development of the Sermon on the Mount, says to Matthew, Matthew, think about salt. It's so common, but it influences things that it comes in contact with. It heals. It's an antiseptic. Did you realize that? A lot of times when people rinse their sinuses, they use salt water. It's an antiseptic. It kills infection. Salt's a preservative. Back in the old days, people would take meat, a ham, put it in a salt box, rub salt all over it. Salt preserved it. It kept things from decomposing. Salt had an influence. But you see, salt, if it's good salt, has to come in contact with the things that it preserves and purifies. And Jesus said, you need to be like salt. You need to have an influence on the world. You need to come in contact with people who need to be preserved, who need to be cleaned up. You need to be salt, Jesus said. You, verse 13, are the salt of the earth. But then he goes right into the but statement. He said, but if salt has lost its taste, if I'm calling you salt, but you're really salt that's worth nothing, you have no influence on other people, it's worthless, he says. If it's lost its taste, if it's lost its ability to preserve and cleanse, then you're worthless salt. He said, then at that point, how can it be restored? If it's lost its taste, how will the saltiness be restored? He said, basically, it's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. All right, let's break this down. Jesus says, church, you are salt. You need to go out and rub shoulders with other people and influence them. You need to have that preserving and cleansing ability. Why? Because we share the good news of Jesus. And you're like, Brother Tom, I'd love to, but I'm just too busy. I'm not trained in those areas. We'll let somebody else who's better at that do it, but not me. All right. If that's the case, Jesus says you're worthless salt church. Sorry if that insults you. I'm sorry if that makes you uncomfortable, but that's exactly what Jesus is saying in the context of the Sermon on the Mount. If you, church, claim to be saved and you don't go out and tell other people about me and influence them, you are worthless salt. My father looking down says, take that salt, throw it out worth nothing if it can't preserve if it can't heal and influence the things it comes in contact with it's worthless I don't want you at Stroudsville to be worthless salt so think really hard about how you influence other people with the message of Jesus Think about one person you could influence. One person you could share Jesus with. I want you to think about your friends who need Jesus. You are the cure because you have the gospel and you understand. You are the salt. In verse 14, continuing, he says, he said, disciples, 
It's like traveling on a dark road in the wilderness. You're way out where there's no light at all. And you begin to see a glow way, way off in the distance on a hill. You see a glow. And in your heart and your mind, you're like, oh, good. There's a city there. I can make it. I can make it. I can, I can refresh. I can drink water. I can sleep. I can eat food. I'm going to be all right. If I stay out here in the wilderness, I'm with wild beasts. I'm exposed to the elements. I don't have food. I don't have water. But I can make it. You see, he says, you, you church, are like the city up on the hill where people out wandering in the wilderness and in the darkness need somewhere. They need to see the light. They need that place that's refuge. You're a city set on a hill. You cannot be hidden. Nor do people put light under a lamp and put light, uh, light a lamp and put it under a basket, but they put it on a stand. It gives light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Christians don't keep Jesus a secret was never designed to be that way. We don't have the opportunity as Christians to say, I'll just be passive with my Savior. I'll just keep the salvation to myself. Never intended to be that way. I want to challenge you. I want to shake things up a little bit in your life. I'm going to ask you directly, who have you told about Jesus who have you gotten involved with and said, I care about you, God loves you, and you matter? That's being a good neighbor, that's being good salt, and that's being the light on the hill. You let your light shine, this little light of mine. What have we seen? I'm going to let it shine all around the neighborhood. Are you a good neighbor? Have you let your light shine? Have you told other people about Jesus? Because I just have to believe, church, if we think everything's just great and we haven't told anybody, anybody about Jesus and we end up before the Lord on the day of judgment and the Lord says, just let me know who have you told about me. Well, Lord, I, I've been busy. I, I'm, I'm an active member. I put my money in the plate. I'm a good person. But who have you told about me? That's what... God wants to know, who have you told about me? In whose life have you gotten involved? Who have you shared the gospel with? In whose life have you made a difference? Be salt and be light, church. In summary today, we can and should influence through our example. We don't even have to use words. People just need to know that we care about them and then, like effective salt, we change those that we rub shoulders with. We make a difference in their life. They see something in us that is different. Finally, be like a light from a city, shining on a hill. Shine around those who are in the dark. Shine around those who need Jesus and be a good influence on them. It's a simple message, but the challenge is yours. What will you do with Jesus? We're going to sing an invitation song. Our time is up, but we want you to reflect and be honest. Trusting in his grace, sir, are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments?
and spotless are they white as are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless, are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless, are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Again, we appreciate each of you being here this morning, whether in person or by live stream. I'd like to invite you to be back with us tonight at 6 o'clock for evening worship. Any other final announcements? Not our closing song will be number 85. We'll sing both verses, number 85. You are Lord of creation and Lord of my life, Lord of the land and the sea. You were Lord of the heaven before there was time, and Lord of all, Lord, you will be. We bow down and we worship you, Lord, we bow down. And we worship you, Lord, we bow down. And we worship you, Lord, Lord of all, Lord, you will be. You are King of creation and King of my life, King of the land and the sea. You were King of the heaven before there was time. And King of all kings you will be. We bow down and we crown you the king. We bow down and we crown you the king. We bow down and we crown you the king. King of all kings you will be. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful Lord's Day that you so richly blessed us with and you give us the opportunity to come together as a band of thy children and sing these songs and hear another lesson from your word. Dear Heavenly Father, we just ask that you would please be with each and every one of us that we will be the salt and the light of this world that you'd have us be. Dear Heavenly Father, that we will not blend in and do the things that the people in the world are doing, that they can see that we are different. And by us being different, that we can, in some way, show them love that you had for us when you came and died on the cross, that we can also show their, them that we love them and care for them in whatever situation that they're in, that we can spread the gospel to them. Dear Heavenly Father, we just pray that we will be the type of uh, congregation that you would have us to be in this community. Dear Holy Father, that we can spread the gospel to those because there's many souls out there that are lost. And Dear Holy Father, we need to look at each soul and think, 
What if we were out in the world? Wouldn't we want someone telling us the good news so that we could spend eternity in heaven with you as well? So, dear Heavenly Father, please put a burden on each one of us that we can have that and we can reach those that are lost. In the meantime, dear Heavenly Father, we just pray that you will be with us, that we will stay strong and continue to read and study your word and know how that you want us to live and conduct our lives that we can someday spend eternity in heaven with you. Dear Heavenly Father, we just know that on our prayer list here there are many people uh, that are sick, that are going in for tests or have been in the hospital and got out. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for their improvement. We just ask you to please be with those that are sick, that they will get better. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask you at this time to be with all those that are grieving over loss of loved one especially the Christians and family. Dear Heavenly Father, comfort them as only you can. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much that you is willing to give your son that we can have a home in heaven with thee someday if we're found faithful. We just pray that you'll be with us and forgive us where we fail you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.